back to Crane Durham's Nothing But Truth. Nothing But Truth. On AFR Talk. What kind of Christian are you, Crane? You're putting your foot through the television? I mean, how dare you? I'm a disciple in progress, and it's nothing but truth. I'm being honest. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. I'm not going out and saying, hey, television sets, watch out. Here come the feet. The big foot. No, what I'm saying is these are very frustrating times in the sense of getting a straight answer, but actually they elucidate the picture of what we are contending with, which is deception. Crane, welcome people back to the show, man. You just kind of jumped, I know. Crane Durham's Nothing But Truth proudly on AFR Talk. Now, coming up, Mika Brzezinski makes a comp. Mika who? Oh, yeah, she's on Morning Joe, very popular show on MSNBC, I think. And, well, I know it's on MSNBC. I don't know how popular it is. Joe Scarborough was a Republican congressman, and now he serves as the conservative in quotations. Very bright guy. And they have occasionally good discussions, but they do tilt to the left. And without giving away what Mika Brzezinski said, let's just put it this way. President Obama once called George W. Bush unpatriotic. Mika Brzezinski takes it to a whole new level when it comes to Ted Cruz, Senator Ted Cruz. So we'll get to that. Also, back to the original point of discussing these issues. These are real. These are not something I look at in an academic sense and say, ooh, how do these work out? This is about our children. People say that a lot, our children. We have a garden, and we want to make sure we tend the garden, and government's like a garden. No, this is about our kids. This is about our kids' First Amendment rights. This is our, about our children's ability and right to worship God. It's about our ability and right to express the fact that you could have a wonderful constitution and rights outlined in our declaration and an awesome history, quite frankly, of a great country, greatest country ever to be, arguably, I would say. And yet, if you do not have a citizenry that understands the importance of family, understands the importance of God, understands the importance of our rights, our natural rights, our God-given rights, and embraces statism because the family is broken down completely and the state's filling those needs. I mean, it's, it's natural. If daddy's not there, daddy will come in in the state and they'll do a really terrible job and they'll raise people to be dependent on the state. It's, it's awful. And it will destroy America, truly. And it, it is right now. Now, there are many battles in this war. We call it a culture war. I think it's premised, everything is premised on the culture war because at, at its heart, you could have wonderful written documents and laws, but if they're not followed, if people don't understand the importance of following through and holding people to account, and our institutions are only as strong as the people within those institutions. And again, it comes back to the foundation. Then we're, we're gone. So we talk about politics. We talk about how important the things are. I, I realize God's so much bigger than all of this. Blink of an eye, change it. God's economy doesn't have recession. But we should analyze the problems that are existing in our government because it's the structure of power that's going to be used against future generations to extract what we have built up in costs. And if that government does not respect the individual's rights, well, we haven't left in America to our children. We've left something altogether different. So just a thought. Buffet, take it, leave it. From a disciple in progress, doing the best I can with my shaped head. And as we talk about that, we also talk about, we just talked about the internal in America. Now let's talk about the foreign policy and defending America. It's actually one of the few constitutional roles of our federal government. And oftentimes it gets a little lost in that. It goes more toward the welfare state than understanding that, hey, they're there to first and foremost protect us. And in doing that, we have to understand our enemy. We have to understand our allies, our 
ally, number one ally in the world, I would argue, yes, absolutely, would be Israel. And when we push them to do certain things, like negotiate with terrorists and release prisoners and a whole host of things in line to the neighboring countries and the regional enemies that Israel has without recognizing history, well, we're setting ourselves up for a big fall. But Israel is going to feel the brunt of that first and foremost. And I'm speaking to Iran in a whole litany of attacks that have taken place because of the number one terror supporting state in the world and second only to al-Qaeda with the American blood on their hands. Our guest, the Clarion Project, Dot org. It's the Clarion Project, but clarionproject.org is the website, national security analyst Ryan Morrow. And Ryan, when I heard the story of a mission in Somalia, not they didn't, they didn't uh, fulfill the mission in the sense of they, it wasn't accomplished to the degree that it was set out to be. They didn't get the terrorists they were trying to find and get. And then they did get the terrorist, one of the alleged conspirators in the 1998 embassy bombings, I thought to myself, well, this is a lot better than the drone policy, and certainly this is a way to go that tells me, has the Obama administration now taken another look at their approach in fighting Islamists, Islamic terror networks, and they're going to be proactive and less uh, reactive? It's, it's hard to say. Um, the Special Operations Command uh, sources that I've talked to have always said that Obama liked to fight uh, in the dark, that there were a lot of these things going on, that the, these type of covert operations were increased significantly once he became president, and so his style was just different. But I've been disappointed in how the Obama administration has framed these two raids. Um, I don't I think that we need to counter the narrative that the raid in Somalia was just a failure, uh, because the the fact is that there is success in getting a close source of information uh, that's near one of the leaders of Al Shabaab to the point where you can even launch a raid and nearly get the guy. We have to respond to these t this type of propaganda that Al Shabaab puts out there, where they say they beat back the U.S. Navy SEALs and therefore it was a victory for them. No, it wasn't a victory for them. They went on a house-by-house -house search in the area of Somalia where the raid took place because they were so convinced that there is a traitor in their myth. I like to see them scared. And so even with the release of this information, you, you mentioned originally that the president likes these things done in the dark. And I actually think that would be a good way to go because I don't know the in value of releasing information of what we're doing. Tell me, is that something that existed, these types of actions existed under the Bush administration and even the Obama administration, and we just didn't know about them, and now we're learning about them? And if so, is it a good thing that we're learning about these captures and attempted captures? Oh, it definitely did occur under the Bush administration. As for the increase that happened once President Obama came into power, that may be the result of an increase in resources. We don't know uh, exactly how that happened, if it, if it was just because President Obama said, I want more of these, or if just more resources became available to him that President Bush didn't have. But whatever the case may be, uh, there's definitely going to be books written in the future about these dramatic covert operations that were happening behind the scenes. And I actually think that we should be releasing more information about this. And that's because of the message it sends. There's a tendency in the government to classify anything and everything under the sun and to say, let's protect it all. I think that we should release mostly everything except for what's absolutely necessary for national security because we will, this is partially a mind game. Let the enemy understand that when they think that they're safe in someone's basement, for all they know, in the middle of the night, one of our guys could crawl through the window and take them out. And this would be a good thing for maybe the president to start making some speeches about defining who we are, what we represent, and what the people that share our vision represent, and the Islamists. Between oh, the two. absolutely. Uh, in terms of the ideology, there's been a major failure. 
Uh, there was a major failure under the Bush administration with this, but at least they understood that there was an ideological battle that had to be fought, even if they fought it incorrectly. Obama doesn't even acknowledge that this is an ideological fight. He won't say things like Islamo-fascist or radical Islam. And the real smoking gun as to how absurd this policy is uh, comes in an interview that I did with a man named Mohammed el who is the top Muslim advisor at the Department of Homeland Security. And the Daily Caller just released a report about my interview with him and research I did. And this guy, who is advising the Department of Homeland Security, it explicitly says nice things about the Muslim Brotherhood and says that the largest terrorism finance trial in the U.S. history shouldn't have happened because he knows the guy is innocent because he's been friends with him for a long time, the guy that led the uh, terror financing charity. That's a major conflict of interest, and the fact that the media isn't all over this, that you can have someone who speaks openly about Islamist, he uses that term, that should be a scandal. It's amazing that it isn't. And i got to tell you, I like the way you're taking the segues, because you've learned that <laughs> I will butcher them. But it is outstanding, and it's also outstanding in the sense of outstanding of the write-up on your work and what you've done to expose this. But this is somebody who is working in our government, an advisor to, the homeland, to Homeland Security, and he is a supporter of our enemies. He Directly. argues that Islamists and the Muslim Brotherhood are not our enemies and are good positive forces, and that the U.S. should look to Islamists that are not al-Qaeda as your ally. If you've ever wanted to know why the Obama administration is so naive when it comes to the Muslim Brotherhood, this interview is your answer. And he's not just a regular advisor to the Department of Homeland Security, someone that they consult with from time to time. He actually sits on the advisory council and was recently promoted, so he sits in the top council and is in a special position on that already senior council. So this is a top guy. And he said that the Muslim Brotherhood is essentially the equivalent of evangelical Christians in the United States. How did he get there? I mean, in the sense of, I understand the recent promotion and there, but this is, obviously it didn't just happen overnight here, launch into this. Where did he come from and how did he move up in the ranks? Well, he has his own company uh, related to intelligence called Lo Lone Star Intelligence. He was a Muslim activist in Texas. Uh, he was well-liked by Republicans because he's a member of the Republican Party. He was actually a delegate for McCain in 2008. And so he's built lots of friendships across the aisle. And so he's been in a position uh, to, to where uh, he's even been awarded by the FBI for his involvement in counterterrorism efforts. And so because he's been fruitful in his af efforts to battle violent extremists, apparently that means that his record on the Muslim Brotherhood and other groups just doesn't even get looked at. But this is a phenomenon that a lot of people don't understand that is very common in the federal government. It's very much based on who you know, not what you know and what you've done. And Republicans, as you mentioned, have a blind spot. It's often, uh, you hear these stories every now and then of people missing a blind spot and saying, in essence, and these are Republicans, uh, I say Republicans more and focusing on them because if there's going to be a conservative party in America, it would be more toward the Republican side in, in, in discussing these issues and a more of a hawkish response in foreign policy and more neocons within there. So my question is, we are, we've seen governors, we've seen people really turned a blind eye, people for tax reform, uh, turn a blind eye to Islamist activities. Exactly. And the front runner for the Republican nomination, according to the latest CNN poll, is Governor Chris Christie. And, of course, Mohammed el the, the DHS advisor that we've been talking about, likes Governor Christie. And that's because Governor Christie, uh, and who's a man that, on, on a personal level, I like his style, but the facts speak for themselves, which is that he has defended a Hamas-linked imam in New Jersey whose deportation is sought by the Department of Homeland Security. So you have the Department of Homeland Security trying to kick out an individual of Hamas links, and that individual has Chris Christie advocating on his behalf. So what's, what's the answer here? Because obviously it, all Americans don't want terrorist attack. All Americans... Uh, certainly, excuse me, are 
people like Chris Christie don't believe in Sharia law. They don't believe in an Islamist approach to politics or, or the world. So why on earth? What's the blind spot? I mean, I realize I've heard Grover Norquist also has this blind spot. I mean, there are people out there who have a blind spot of looking at what these people are and by their actions and say, oh, I'm not going to see that part. I'm just seeing this part. So tell me, what's the answer here? We have got to broaden the focus beyond al-Qaeda, because whenever you talk about the Islamic terrorist threat, everyone thinks of 9-11, understandably. But we have to focus more on human rights around the world, because that's where the, the problem is, is that this is the Islamist ideology, and the, that's the problem. The problem is not how the Islamist ideology is practiced, whether it's violent or nonviolent. At its core, it's the ideology, and that's exactly what we have to focus on, and Americans have to care enough about this issue that when politicians engage in this type of behavior, because they are blinded by personal relationships, which is the most blinding factor uh, I have found in my research, that they have to pay a price. Because the reason Governor Chris Christie is defending this Hamas-linked imam, for example, is because he calls him a friend. If I were to come to you and say that your relative robbed a bank, you would say that's impossible. Why? Because you know them and you love them. And so you would ask for evidence that is just so ironclad that it might not even be able to be reached. And that's what happens on the political level, too. Well, again, they have a responsibility to the citizens in Chris Christie's case, specifically of New Jersey, and for our leader's case and our government's case to the people of the United States, citizens of the United States. And you're exposing this, and it's tough because it's a minefield of what you're dealing with, Ryan, in so many ways. But we appreciate your dedication to the truth, and i got to have you on tomorrow night. I'm just asking right now. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Great piece, great work. Crane Durham's up to the truth, AFR Talk.